It's been a long time coming. Almost all of the touch-ups are done and drying, and we're ready to buff this little, lovely little Miss Ashley out. And boy, I've, this is the time I've been looking forward to. This is what I call coming down a home stretch. Any, any video or any instruction that goes into buffing out paint, or in this case, Brodac dope, I'd like to start, and I think it's a real good investment in everybody's time, spend about five minutes and go over what, what it is we're actually trying to accomplish here. Let me do a little storyboard as to what I know about buffing out paint, because it'll make understanding when we actually do it a lot easier. Now, I don't know how many people can share this experience with me, but I, I refer to this as the old days. In the old days, you'd go up to somebody that had a beautifully buffed out plane, and which there were very, very few, by the way, and you'd say, gee, Mr. XYZ, how did you do that? And they'd say, kid, it's a lot of work. Now, needless to say, I had asked several people years ago, and they gave me that as an answer, and I says, well, if the day ever comes that I figure out how to do this, Believe me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna screw you all. I'm gonna tell the world. So there it was, 1963. I had built the Nobler, and I had never sprayed a plane before. Harold Price graciously showed me how to spray it, how to wet sand it, and most of all, how to buff it. And believe me when I tell you, I can remember it like it was yesterday. When I got done buffing that plane out, I felt like. My whole world had changed. Wow. Now I was just like one of the big guys. I could have a shiny airplane anytime I wanted it. And I give Harold Price all the credit in the world for helping me through that first buff out. Now, back to the old days. And even Harold, way back in the old days, we wet sanded out the plane with 400, think of this now, 400 wet and dry. And then we would take red or white rubbing compound. Now, the trick was back then, you sanded it all out with 400, eh, it got a little dull, oh, you went through the silk span, eh, you went through the canopy, didn't even bother touching it up. Got to do the red, the white compound deal, you do, used to be able to do the red first, then the white, and then polish it up with some wax, Simonize or whatever. That was the old days. Now, thank God the old days are over. And the days of using Brodac dope, right from the get-go, make this part of the job relative to using other material, other brands of dope, other materials. Make it a piece of cake. There's, there's no reason anybody shouldn't be able to buff out a plane. 1963 is a long ways away. Now, in the year 2000, the system that I'm going to show is basically a thousand times better than what we had way back then. Now, the way we're going to show to do this, believe me again, and believe me over and over again, so much better, so much easier. I hope no matter what plane you're building, buffing, whatever, this is information you can use you can save in your video library. It's not going to go out of style. And when you compare it to the old days of 400 and red and white compound to today, M600, getting everything flattened out like we did in the last video, and now the buffing part, Gorham Silver Polish. It's going to make you Make what years ago was only a pipe dream a reality for everybody. All the guys that years ago wouldn't tell anybody anything about finishing. <laughs> Looks like I got the last laugh. Maybe. Once you wet sand the plane like we did on the last video, that's a whole nother a whole nother issue. You get a totally flat, touchable spots. You need to get a couple. I use about two or three little tubs of Gorham Silver Polish. Now a couple of a couple of things that do and don't work. 
This is Gorham Silver Polish. It's a pink paste. When you go to the store, they'll probably tell you they don't make it anymore. We don't have it. We can't get it. I still have it in stock. And, you know, I seem to get it every time I go to the grocery store. I find a few left over. This seems to be the best. And I have tried hundreds of different compounds and polishes that were $30 for a jaw this size, all kinds of car waxes, all kinds of exotic things, toothpaste. I, I can't even remember, but a tub of this is all you need to get started. Now in my house, this is a common sight, old socks. So what I do is a week before I go buffing, I go through my sock drawer, find the oldest socks, and I want to have this side out. So you have one side of, a, of an athletic, obviously you could buy them. You could use a towel, which is a good second choice. But what's nice about these, they make little mitts. See, one side is not that good, but the other side, when you turn an old athletic sock inside out, it's nice and fuzzy on one side. And you don't want to keep using it over. You want to keep using a new spot on the sock. So it's good. In this case, I have two or three old pairs of socks turned inside out on the fuzzy side to get started. Understand a little bit of why a rough surface, light comes in here and bounces back. Light will come in here and bounce off at this angle. Some light comes down, bounces at this angle. What happens with any multifaceted surface is not what we want because we don't get a true reflection. A reflection like you get in a mirror, you candle it and you get one light angle. Light bounces and bounces up, but it bounces up very intensely because all the light is bouncing up at the same angle. It's why when you candle a buffed out part, let's just use this pen for an example. It, it, you don't see any light, any light, and all of a sudden, boop, there's the light. See how the light comes across there? Boop, and now it's gone. Well, on a built-up wing, there's always a rib in focus, the same way as there is on a diamond. There's always one facet picking up the light. Where on a flat surface, like a foam wing, you're going to get one reflection, and then it's going to disappear. So if you understand what we're trying to accomplish, or open bay or I-beam wing, what's going to happen? Each one of these facets or areas is going to have a different angle of reflection. And that's why when you put a plane down on the floor, an I-beam wing plane or plane with ribs, it just sparkles and glows. That's when you look at the planes in appearance judging. And I have these videos of all the appearance judging over the years. Notice how the light reflects up off of them. Notice how it's hitting a metal flake in Sam Sherrata's plane, then it's hitting an open bay. When you go back and forth, see how that light's reflecting. Well, that's what we're trying to accomplish, is to maximize that. So that there's always something sparkling and showing, making a plane stand out in a crowd. That's the whole objective of buffing. The other objective, there's another objective, is to make it aerodynamically better. The drag, the parasitic drag on a plane is reduced when it's buffed out. That's another thing. Uh, and that is a, probably as a final little bit of dessert. You can look at the, some of the lights clicking off the Spitfires, off some of the other planes. Every plane shows the light reflects back a little bit differently. And the idea is to have yours reflect more light than the other person. And think of what would reflect more light, a piece of cardboard or a mirror? Well, because a mirror is flat, glass reflects light. Anything flat, flat reflects light. Oh, a small benefit, one I wouldn't count as super big, but when you're wiping a ship off, if you've ever had to wipe off a plane that isn't buffed out, it's like trying to wipe off a piece of sandpaper. It's really inconvenient. Remember back in 1963, the first time I wiped off the oil off a plane that was buffed out, I said, oh, I just was so happy. As a, as a young kid back then, I just was thrilled, and I, and I made it my... The, my mission in life, I went on to have a very successful motorcycle painting business and other little things that have served me well over the years, but I'll never forget that first buffed out plane. Now remember, we had selective finishing. Now we have the second part of that is selective buffing. By selective buffing, first off, anybody, <laughs> anybody that has any common sense would figure out you want to put the majority of your time into buffing out the parts that you're going to see most frequently. 
You want all these areas to be relatively perfect. The other thing, if it comes down to the, the bottom of the plane, yeah, you want it, but, but you don't have to make yourself crazy. But let's make a pretend up. Let's pretend you went to balance the plane, or even after you flew it, you've already flown the plane, and God, this thing is tail heavy. So what you need is this big, giant, lead, two-ounce lead weight or a steel weight in the front. Well, gee, you don't want to have that. Well, what's one of the choices? You could pretty much start at the, fl I like to start at the flap hinge line. And everywhere from here back, you could buff out even to the point, buff out even more. Just re-sand and re-buff the plane. And there's a lot of times you can get a half ounce off. It's not uncommon, if you've, especially if you've got a lot of paint on, to be able to get a half ounce off. But that usually means you're going to be able to get about three quarters of an ounce off the front. Well, what it allows you to do is you're getting the plane in balance, getting rid of the nose weight, getting rid of the weight back here, and getting rid of the total weight all at the same time. So selective, selective buffing is one of the criteria that we have. We're always going to try to do a little bit better job on the top than the bottom. We're going to do more air, more time touching it up. We're also, we know on the bottom of this plane, for instance, we know we have about one-third of the clear is on the bottom of this plane, so we're not going to go crazy on the bottom. But when it comes to the top, we'd really like to do our best possible work on the top of the plane. And what this does, by selectively doing it, the amount of time we're willing to put into it, we, we can maximize the effect of the effort that we're putting into it and the t amount of time we're willing to spend on it. Now, I learned over the years, and I learned the real hard way, because I'm an impatient person. I'm always in a rush. One of the things I learned right away is don't rush. These are the, these are the most common reasons people don't get a good result. Don't rush. In the case of Miss Ashley, we've been sanding and for about two weeks sanding and touching up sanding well this would be a real dumb thing is right now to rush it it's going to take in i'll use joe adamusco as a good example it takes him about 40 hours to buff out a plane probably takes me the same amount of time you can't rush it if you try to do it in 35 it looks a third is good first thing don't rush it I know many people have told me they've been able to use thousand grit they've been able to use 800 grit they've been able to use 600 in all the time I've used Brodak dope and having done many Brodak finishes now, nothing, nothing is going to be better than 1200. The reason is there'll be no scratches. And that's a problem, is if you use a rougher sandpaper, you wind up, it cuts a lot quicker, but you wind up in the final product, you can see the scratches when you really candle it well. Another thing I've learned really the hard way. I've tried, and, and I had I have no sense mentioning a name, but somebody sent me a $30 can of polish. I buffed out one flap or elevator with it, I remember, and I said, my God, it's not only 10 times the price, it takes 10 times as long to work. Well, what I found is in the long run, if you stick with Gorham's all the way, and at the very end, at the very end, when it's all ready to fly, you, you might want to, and this would be totally optional. There's a product 3M co makes called Final Shine that will even highlight it. What I usually do is I put Final Shine on just before appearance judging, but it's, it's a, it just adds a little more gloss to it. It has plenty of gloss with Gorms. So the, there's simple little rules that will make this easy for you to do understand anything about paint when I say this wait the longer the better what I mean is yes and I proved to myself in the early stages of developing Brodak dope I tried to buff the surface an hour after it was sprayed on a sunny day yes you can do it but it requires X amount of labor every day that you're able to wait probably up to a week maybe even two weeks it's going to get harder what happens is the surface gets harder and a hot, the harder the surface is, the quicker it's going to buff, and the better it's going to buff, both at the same time. So by rushing, you're only making three times work. And I often made an example up of two guys, two twin brothers. 
They both painted their plane on Monday. One started buffing on Tuesday, the other guy waited till Friday. They both got done on Sunday. The other guy only spent four extra days buffing. Now that's, all, that's an overstatement, but it's probably not far from being true. One of the best time savers I've found over the years, whether it's a take apart plane or a typical normal construction, don't put the hinges in until after the plane is buffed out. You, the time you save by not having to go back in and resand the hinge lines and, and try to take a blade and gouge out all the paint off the hinges, the fact that you get in right at the very end and get the hinges in, don't put the hinges in. The first time you go and you do it the way I'm showing on the video, You'll probably, number one, write me a letter and say, Wendy, you don't know what you're talking about. You're completely off balance here. Or you'll probably realize I just saved you a week of grinding and sanding and taking that sandpaper and going into hinge lines. Yuck. Install the hinges after you buff the plane. Don't put the hinges in during construction. One of the, one of the lessons I learned the hard way. Got my real short list of do's things you can do to make life easier for yourself. We'll show this up close and personal as soon as we actually get started on a buffing. Use socks as mitts. This as a, as a good example, use a padded table. What used to happen to me many times, I'd get to this point and I'd be putting it in my lap and before you know it, I'd wind up putting a button in the leading edge and then a zipper someplace else, a belt buckle, a ring, a Use a padded table. When you're buffing, it can get pretty aggressive and violent. What I do is I lay several old towels, blankets, padding, a bed pad, anything, so that you're working on a soft surface. That's always a big help. You're going to buff. Believe me, I know for some people out there, this may be something foreign to them, but lose the jewelry. You wind up with, like, guys come in here with these big, college rings and all kind of things drooling off their fingers lose the jewelry the first time you put a ding in something and you got to repair it and to tell you the truth guys in modeling are not impressed with jewelry you can bet you can impress them more with a shiny finish than with a big diamond ring that is except for Karen this one may seem like a little uh, like like I'm I'm losing my mind. Well, maybe I am. Here's what happens if you can get a friend to help. Now, I remember Lou Dudkin and Glenn Metter used to go through this. They'd, bo they'd bit get both of the planes in clear, then go over and they'd both work on one plane until it was done, and then they'd work on the other one until it was done. Well, the reason it goes faster is when you're working with somebody on a job together, it just, the time goes more pleasantly, and I think you tend to do a better job because you're saying, oh, gee, I want my part to be better than his part kind of a competitive thing. So in my case, years ago, this used to be possible. I used to get together with people, buff their plane out, then we'd buff my plane out. Well, it just happens because of my work schedule now, and with the schedule at the machine shop, it isn't really practical. I work on models at, at very odd times. But if you can work, well, another thing you'll find out is if it takes you 20 hours to buff out a plane, it takes your friend 20 hours, you probably, when you work together, you can do them both in less time. It'll probably take you eight hours to do one model with two guys working on it. Because a lot of times you need somebody to, especially if it's not a take apart plane, you need them to hold it, hold it in this angle, hold it on a side, so, or you can use a finishing friend if you have room for one. And by the way, in our new shop, we plan on having a, a finishing friend. But if you can work together, it just makes what otherwise is a very boring a job of drudgery go relatively quickly. Now, Bill Hummel gave me this picture. This is one of the few pictures I have. This, you notice that's my AMA number on it. This was the first real plane that I had finished, wet sanded, and totally buffed out myself. And I went to the 62 Nats with this plane, and I was so proud of it. Harold Price, I know he was, <laughs> and this is a true story. I'm not going to make this up. We drove out in Harold's car, and I was 16. I hadn't turned 17 because my 17th birthday would have been in August, and it was only July. 
And it was getting late on a ride out there, and Harold said, you know, why don't you drive for a while? You have a driver's license, don't you? And I said, oh, sure, of course. I had never driven a car before in my life. And here we are in the middle of Ohio. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm driving this car, and all I can think about is if I whack it, these two planes would have been totally destroyed. <laughs> True story. Story a little bit later, you get to 1967, and think of buffing out this I-beamer. And this was, believe me when I tell you, one of the things, I have nightmares about this. I buffed every rib, the tail was built up, the rudder, it was a flat tail. Every rib station buffed by hand. Talk about things you're proud of. Now, years later, I still have the plane or what's left of it after a crash in my garage. Every once in a while, I look up at it and I say, I still can't believe I did it. But anyway, now we're going to do Miss Ashley. It's time. Best thought. Anytime you buff out a plane, there's, there's areas you're going to be prone to go through on. For sure, the hinge lines, if you leave them razor sharp. So I always try to put just the slightest little radius in them. Edges. I always try to put extra clear on the edges. And now is when you're going to see the merit or the value of having that little extra clear on the edges. In the case of Miss Ashley, the lettering has a lot of extra clear on it. I always try to get extra around a canopy because I know they rub their hand on that right away. Any place that you know you're going to need extra clear on, that's the place where you're going to be prone to buff through. Well, that's the part that you want to be real careful of. When you're out in a flat area here and buffing away, you're not going to buff through. More than likely, not going to buff through. But these edges, these are the areas where you're prone to buff through and where you'd like to be a little extra careful. best to start with a part that's been dry the longest. That's number one. Number two, that has a lot of flat surfaces so you can kind of get the feel for how this is going to go. And beside the complex parts, you want to do last. So we'll try the bottom of this just to see if this dope, now this is more than a week dry. Now let's get some idea of how this is going to buff out. It's all, let me get this out of the way, it's all sanded flat. And I want to see what kind of time we're looking at to buff this out. Well, doesn't look so bad, does it? <laughs> Magic trick. Anyway, once you do all the prep work, the buffing is really a small part of it. And you can see that's when it's sanded. So that the buffing then, except for the wing where the silk span bays are, And if you follow, you know, obviously you don't have to follow it like it's uh, the Bible or something. But the tips that I'm giving you, they'll work to perfection. Now, every once in a while, I go back and I run over to my little jar. Of, I call, I have a little drawer with all kind of experimental stuff people send me. And I get out some of these fancy waxes that are $30, McGuire's wax. And I have never found anything better than Gorham's. And as a side benefit, it's it's rel relative to some of these car waxes. It's, it's dirt cheap. Anyway, let's see if it just over here. This is our test piece. Probably going to be about uh, 15 minutes to do the whole piece. But it's all in the preparation. And it's in the preparation of that 1,200 sandpaper. And you want to go right now. In this case, by the edges, I don't want to get that edge knocked down. So I want to get right up to the edge. And boy, if I could only explain to you, if I could only get the point. Because if I could put you in my shoes when I was a kid and the first time I did exactly what I'm doing now. And I looked at Harold and I said, oh, my God. I just thought it was so nice. I was so impressed with myself. I didn't know that, uh, you know, 30 or 40 or 40 years later, I should say. A long time later, in the future, that I'd be uh, doing this as a regular thing. And I managed, over the course of my lifetime of having the motorcycle business for all those years, I managed to make some, uh, some relatively enjoyable money painting motorcycles, many of which went on to win awards of various kind, be on the cover of magazines, things like that, but, but nothing like the airplanes. 
And the trick with the airplanes is they have to be light. If you could just blow on paint coat, coat after coat, would be a whole different ball game. Now, I'm going to assume most people, this doesn't even have any final shine on it, but that's that's about what we're looking to try to accomplish right there. And usually comes in these gallon jugs. But what I want to do, let me see if I can do this just to give you an idea. I usually sell this in little four or six ounce jars or whatever. Because you don't need a lot of this. And it only serves one purpose, to put that final little extra. It's got to be buffed before you use final shine. And what's best with this is do this just before you go to appearance judging. And the guy will pick up your plane and think it's, wow, it actually feels erotic. Anyway, very light buffing. Now, I don't know if there are anybody, if there are people that can do this, you know, quicker than I can, I'm sure, better than I can, I'm sure. But to, to be able to pull that shine right up, and again, it's kind of a, a standard thing. It isn't, it isn't a high-tech thing. Start with some simple parts first. Don't get caught up trying to invent anything. It's all been invented, and it's probably been invented by 10 different people. It's all in the preparation, and on that last video, sanding all that stuff being sanded out with 1,200. Now, you'll notice another thing. I go through this. I have the other sock. I don't even have to use them as mitts. And I can guarantee you, when you get this done, you'll look back at all the work that you put into the plane, and you'll be proud. Because that is world class right there. And it's not that heavy. It's not so heavy that it's going to make your plane unflyable like some of these other finishing methods are. The 1200, the buffing, the final shine. I, I hope this is leading you down a road where you're going to be able to do that as a matter of, uh, it won't even be a big deal. But that, those are all the tips that seem to work, and they work well. Now what I'm going to do, and I'll do it off camera, because I'll finish this part, because the main thing we want to work on is some of the other little parts that have little angles and areas that are hard to do. do is when I'm finished with a whole part, when the whole part is done, I like to get the final shine, get a, a paper towel now, not a sock, a paper towel. It seems to put it on in a, in a much smoother, finer coat. By the way, you know, uh, there's this show called the Red Green Show, and at the end of the show, I mean, the guy's kind of like, like a windy guy. He's never dressed up or anything. The show is not, you know, like something I couldn't live without, but he's got a closing line that says, if women don't find you handsome, at least they should find you handy. Well, I found out a little secret in life. If you can buff out paint, women do find, women do find you attractive. You ask Casmanato. Anyway, I always, when I get one of these parts buffed, I always wait till Karen comes home from work, and I go over and just go, mmm, with the cheek, and then she gives me the, it's okay, or go back and buff some more. Now you can see it's starting to really come up. And it's that last little bit with the final shine that just blows you away. And actually, you can you could just sit here and watch a football game or whatever. And you could get do this, and I mean it. At some point in time, Karen will be impressed. And this is one of the few parts, it's like instant gratification. When you get to this point, and you see the first, if, now if we had a sunny day, of course it's raining out there, if we had a sunny day, we would do this outside, and you could see the sunlight would make the party shine even more. So you'd be even, even quicker gratification. Anyway, wait till Karen gets home from work, we'll see if, she, if she's impressed or not. And you, obviously you need a final And when you see the shine on these parts, I don't know, I, could, I can see the reflection in the ceiling here. 
And this buff out was relatively easy because we followed all the, I guess, relatively simple steps. Nothing trick about it. There's nothing high tech. Follow the simple steps and be patient. Here you can see the difference. The, the real color of the Miss Ashley Red is coming out now. You can get a feel for what the real color of the model is going to look like when all the buffing is done. And what I'll do, i got about a half hour left. I'll try to get that other bottom. At least I'll have a matched pair. But you can see how that light, that, that light reflection thing. And when it reflects the light like that, then you know you have it. Get in those little areas, what I found out works well, of course, the little wizard. And a little fine grindstone on slow, but a little bit of water or Windex. It just puts a nice finish on there. Because if you leave it painted, what happens as soon as the wrench gets in there, it's history. Now, if you really want to be cute, see, this is this is where sometimes you get too cute. You can put a little bit of gorums in there. Let's see if that works. Of course, it sprays up in your face. Now, my dentist, every time I go to the dentist, Fred is his name. He promises to give me all his old Dremel bits. He's got these cool little ones that you can't even buy in the store. But I never get them. Anyway, for a first day of buffing here, if we get this part done today before Karen gets home, we'll be in Fat City. If you leave the paint in there, for sure, what's going to happen? As soon as a chunk comes out and takes the paint right off the rest of it. To see the first part buff. How does it look? How's it feel, baby? It feels wonderful. Honey. Oh! See, if you can't be a, if like you can't be a big lover, be a big buffer. Like silk. Ooh, ooh, that's so nice. Wish your beard felt like that. Woo, my beard. Hey. I told you, if women don't find you attractive, you can at least buff out their car for them. If you're a bachelor, you'll find being able to buff paint. You go into a bar to pick up women, bring in your Miss Ashley bottom block, and you'll find out in a matter of minutes they'll be all over you. It's the truth. Women love buffed out planes. Oh, it's a thing of beauty. Got two of them done in one day. But again, it's the way that light reflects off it. And if you keep that in mind, you can just lay it like I am on the floor and see where the light's picking up, where it's missing. And that's going to be it for today. Two of these in one day is a good day. Okay, today what I'm going to do, I'm going to start on two, two of the smaller parts. A couple of things I've, I've learned the hard way. When you let these things sit overnight, this is where I was done buffing yesterday, they get kind of gritty, especially the socks. Where's that sock? Now, there was a time, I can't find the sock. There was a time when I thought, oh, I'll just wash the socks and use them over. They really, they lose their, I don't know what, fuzziness or whatever. So what I'm suggesting is, when you start a new day, this is the whole deal. Get rid of all the old stuff, because what happens if you put a scratch in this now, by the time you get the scratch out, you might be down through the paint. And you know, here you have all this work, and it's right at the very end. It's the bottom of the ninth, two are out. You don't want to strike out. So basically, I'm going to deep six this and get all new stuff. Some parts, this just happens to be one of them, that it's one of the techniques I've had is when you have a complex part like this, if you get use the socks as mitts instead of polishing pads, at least to start with, now no matter what happens, every time you're touching the plane, you're buffing it out to some degree. So on a small part, and again, I always get that out of here, the small parts first, get some of the compound on there. But I can just do one little spot at a time. 
Always want to be real careful around the hinge lines. Right? That's where I tend to go through anyway, because I'm clumsy. But just using the uh, the socks like mitts for buffing, very handy way to do it. Of course, at the end of buffing out your plane, your wife will think you're sexy, but you'll have no, sh you'll be barefoot. Yeah? It's true. The first time I showed Karen a, some paint that was buffed out, she's, oh, can we do that to my furniture? Okay, you can see it's coming very quickly this way because no matter where I touch it, I'm especially when we get to the parts of doing a wing. Now I almost always try to finish the part once I get whatever work I'm going to do with the sock. The sock kind of roughs it out and you got to be careful. Sometimes if the paint is real soft, the sock is not appropriate because it's too rough or terry cloth. And in which case, you want to do all the buffing with paper towels. And what I would say is the way to determine that is if the paint is relatively new, less than a week, you probably want to use all paper towels and no socks. If the paint is old, if you let it sit a couple of weeks or some amount of time, what's going to happen is it gets harder and harder and harder. And then it, uh, you don't get those soft, I call them soft scratches in the material. But I always finish up the part with the, uh, the a clean paper towel. Now as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to throw this away. I'm not going to try to use, you know, we had one person in a shop, he tried to buff out his whole plane with one paper towel. No. It'd be a big spender. Put a whole roll in if you have to. But as soon as this is done, then I want to hit it with final shine. I'm trying to go in a race. See, the one thing you don't want to do when you're buffing apart, so for instance here, you don't want to just do this, because you're going to put scratches in. You want to always be moving like the same way an orbital sander does. Change the part, change the angle. And I'm guessing that's that's ready for the final shine right now. And it seems like the final shine works even better when the part is relatively new and soft like this. But what I would suggest, if you're going to go to the Nats or some contest where you really want the plane to look perfect, what you want to do is put the final shine on a, an hour before and buff it with all paper towels, all clean bounty. Now, another thing about paper towels, in our club, within our group, we have the people that are constantly trying to come up with a bargain, and they go out and buy these paper towels that are like 80 grit sandpaper. Well, that's no good either. What I suggest is using nothing but bounties. Bounty seems to be, or Mike Rogers had some brand that was soft like Bounty, but it was like a no-name brand, probably a penny or two a roll cheaper. Now, in other words, now a clean towel, There's a very, very specific way that this works. It's it's not random. It's not like... And you're sure you can invent your own way, that's for sure, but it's, it might take time. And it might cost you a lot of those expensive compounds and waxes, and you'd be all done. You have you spent $300 on stuff to replace a $5 jar of Gorham's. And that, that I think, that is ready. Once you get to that point, you can go over to your wife, rub it on her cheek, and believe me, you're going to be a hero. You are a man among men when you can do that. I mean a true man. Only real men can buff out like that. Boy, if that was only true. Yeah, that really does. That, that part now. Once we start on this part, we'll go through basically the same routine, but we're going to be real careful on edges, anywhere there's an edge, and in the fillet, I'm going to get that little rubber tool to wrap around a little, maybe a piece of sock to get in there. I want to be real careful on all the edges on these parts as I'm doing them. Now one of the things, and I've said before, is you got to avoid that edge, because if you were to take this, 
like a lot of people do, and they start buffing that edge, in a matter of 10 swipes, you'll be through. Because you've concentrated all your energy on the equivalent of a razor point. Now, what's good is I've been trying to do this instead of using a rubber piece, is get in here, kind of squeeze up the soft paper towel and get in the corners before I put the final edge on the corners. Now, because this has been prepped pretty well, it seems like this is this is going relatively quickly. I have to tell you, when you get to this point in the model, well, at least when I do, I start getting real excited about the possibility of, you know, getting the plane flying. Trouble is, we've had such bad weather, even if the plane were done, there's no way. Let me get a clean, always finish it off with a clean towel that's never been used before. The final shine just puts that little protection on it. Now, the one thing you never, you definitely do not want to do for probably maybe a month to two months is wax the plane. The final shine doesn't have any wax or silicone in it. You don't want to take a wax or a silicone because then you seal it and you really slow down or even prevent the, the dope from reaching its final hardness. In this case, now we would just like to let this sit right up to the point of, uh, you know, reaching its final hardness in the next month or so, and then just going over it one more time. Freddy, as soon as we uh, do the hinging, the next thing we can do is hinge the rudder to the fin. By one, the parts are coming to life. And boy, this is an exciting time in the life of a model when you start to see it really come to where it would meet your expectations, or in my case, this is even exceeding my expectations. Now, believe me, when you, when you, <laughs> funny story, when you buff out a flap like this, a flat flap, as opposed to in years gone by, I've made up the uh, the rib flaps. It could take you all day to buff one flap. All day, it could take a week. You really then appreciate the fact that when you're buffing a flat area like this, it, it just goes so quickly. So idiot proof. Windy proof. Anyway, one thing good about this, you really do get a lot of good exercise, and about this time of year, I start feeling like one of these guys going to a bodybuilding show, maybe the WWF will and recruit me. And when I get to this end, I always turn it around. I always like to work in this direction. Maybe I just got a great idea. I had to go for a stress test this year because of some unrelated health problems and maybe what they should do instead of a treadmill they should give you parts to buff and see how see if you can buff out three parts without losing your breath anyway any part of the plane that's flat like this relatively easy relatively quick I try to get all the compound off that I can. Then the next step is I want to get a clean paper towel. Again, the flat parts go relatively quickly. And you think of in the past, I've done several things that have really wasted a lot of time. First off, I've tried using, very unsuccessfully, using various Imran type of products. Yeah, they, they leave a shine, but it, the shine is not as, to me, as dramatic or as, as classic as a buffed out lacquer dope finish. That's number one. Number two, they always are a little bit heavier. That's one thing. I've never seen anything two part that's lighter than, than dope. Anything. Unless there's some magic new stuff on the market, and there probably is, but every time you get involved in that, it's like hitting the reset button, where with dope, it's the devil you know. 
Okay, now once we get to this port, this port anyway, now I need to get another new clean one. But if you see one part, I think all the flat parts are relatively the same. There's no point putting that over and over. All the flat parts, the elevators and things like that, they go relatively quickly. And you can, now I try to avoid the hinge line. I really don't even want to buff the hinge line out. It's, you just go right through it. It's all points and edges. But if you see this on a couple of various parts, I think you can really figure out how to use this information in your own modeling, uh, whatever you're making, P51 or whatever. And that's what I really start to look for. That's what, then I start getting excited about having an airplane. It's coming to life. Like a dinosaur coming out of the egg. set of flaps that I really <laughs> every time I don't appreciate flat flaps I remember this plane relentless and I'll bet it was a weak buff in those flaps out what an ordeal and the tail was the same way yeah I remember buffing those flaps and elevators what a job Of course, that's one of the advantages of a foam wing type plane or a plane with all wood surfaces and no tissue, no open bays. At this point in time, it is a really a monumental saving. Now, what we're going to be developing in the next couple of months after finishing this plane is, and it's my understanding, Midgley already has the Nomex in-house. What we're going to be trying to do is make a carbon fiber Nomex wing in one piece and talk about that should be uh, the best of all worlds. No finishing, no tissue, prime it and paint it. I don't know if we'll get there, but we'll try. Now, way back when, and this was in the early 80s, I remember many of us, including Glenn Metter and Lou Doug, we used to use buffing wheels to buff the planes out. And it was very dangerous because it could catch on a flap, for instance. If it catches a flap, you can lose the plane. If you decide to use any kind of mechanical things, boy, be very, very careful. But in my book, nothing beats 100% buffed out dope. Another plane that was a lot of work to buff out, and as I think about it, every time I take a break, see, I try to take a break from buffing because your arm does get tired. All of those ribs, flaps, elevators, everything ribs. If you look at the reflection in the darker colors, you see how the reflection in the darker colors is much more pronounced than in the, the lighter colors. The dark blue and the black, you get a lot of reflection, a lot of light reflects off of darker colors. That is a plus side and a minus side to that when you design up your paint job. The black, the dark blue, the reds, they really pop the light. The problem is if there's a little mistake, they show it. White tends to this white, light blue light green tend to disguise mistakes so if you feel like you're you're not up to getting things perfect you the idea is to get the part of the plane that might not be perfect to be white you can pretty much see the reflection of the 38 in the flap but the point that i wanted to make is if you understand light reflection you'll understand and the rest of it will all make perfect sense a lot of times you're grinding and sanding and buffing and you don't know why it's not getting better. Almost always because the part is, the paint is too soft or you're rushing it. Lay out the parts that are finished. Hey, you start to see some progress, but I'm looking real carefully to see if I'm getting any sanding scratches in any of these. So far there's no sanding and no grinding and no buffing scratches. This should be, well... If you did have scratches, what it means is you got to re-sand it with 1200 and then rebuff it. It's 
scratches you'll find if you look in them. Now see, in this case, we have a touch-up spot on this elevator here. It's a touch-up spot right at the edge. But if you do see scratches, just sand them out with 1200 so that everything is, everything is flat just like this. If it's all flat with 1200, see, even 1200 leaves scratches, but they come out with the compound. But if you use 800 or 600, the scratches don't seem to come out as quickly. Now, if there ever was a case for not having the elevators glued to the plane when you buff it out, I can remember the last plane I remember. Uh, I don't even want to remember it. Just, just totally made a mess out of it, trying to get the, and then you're banging a rudder and you're banging the tail wheels catching on your sleeve. This is one of the techniques, and it's not new. It's not like some great invention of mine, or uh, it probably goes way back to the beginning of model aviation is leave the hinges for the last thing after the parts are buffed. That alone will save you so much time. Take a little break from, from buffing. Mike is doing a roof on the garage while we're making this video. And we're gonna be making a spray booth out there, a real pro spray booth, so in the future we can we can enjoy the benefits of not painting in the house and having Karen come down on our head. Let's see what you got. Oh, this is look, the fan. It even matches the color. Oh. I mean, well, that's the main thing. I don't care if it works as long as it matches. Is this pro stunt or what? Now, when you, at some future time when we shoot the video for it, we're going to have a spray booth. Oh, man. You sure you didn't buy a toilet by mistake? <laughs> I can't get it can't, in a box. A real contractor. You can't open a box. Damn it. Oh, man. Oh, here we go. Anyway, it's a roof. A roof fan. You think that's gonna move enough air? Oh yeah. We gotta hard wire that in, huh? More than enough. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's gotta be hard wired in. Oh yeah. All right, my man. Thermostat and all. Boy, what a benefit this is gonna be. Karen is just gonna absolutely love you. That's just it. gonna love you. We're it's on a thermostat it. too? Yep. You can hook it up that way if you want. No, we don't need a thermostat. We, we, we're tough guys. We don't need to ever be warm or cool. This has got to run. Look at the color of this. It's gonna yeah, run. that's no, perfect. You won't even that. see it. You won't even no. see it. You're going to put it in the back corner. Right. Well, in the you, back corner, well, when we get to do it. Tell me exactly where you're going to put that booth, and then that's where I'll put it. Okay, well, you did half of the roof already, so I guess we don't have a choice. Huh? <laughs> it ain't going to be on that side. That's a Mondo, yeah. Yeah. I like that. It. It's like a giant mushroom. It's the one. So from this point on, you say my paint jobs are going to improve 100%, huh? 100%. <laughs> I don't think so. But you try to get work done, you try to work in your shop, and then all of a sudden, in comes Mike. <laughs> and the day goes right down the drain, and right you got to climb ladders toilet. and beat up all ways. Now, one by one, we're starting to close in on having all the little easy parts done. And the last thing for today is going to be to try to get at least one of the fuselages buffed out. Again, then we get into the complex parts with a lot of angles and edges. And I usually, I like to do all the easy parts first. It's just the way I'm used to working. I get in kind of a rhythm and a, I get to know just about how long and how, how much effort is going to be into one of these parts. And then I'll take one of the complex ones like the fuselage. And the wing will be last. Now you would think at some point in time, at least with this little guy, we've finished all the little touch-ups. We've been touching up around the canopy, some of the little spots in the back where the red was kind of thin. Now we're not going to, the areas that we've touched up, I'm just going to go right over them because we have a really, really small amount of touch-up paint on top of them and it's only a day old. If I know if I go to sand it, what's going to happen is I'm going to wind up popping right through, busting through. So what I'd like to do is just as as conveniently as possible is just go right over the touch-up areas first. So if I go through, and obviously I'll clean it with M600 and retouch it up, and then that can dry while I'm working on the other piece. To this point, I mean, the sock is pretty well, this, this material gets cakey. I've used both sides of the sock. Time to deep six the sock. We'll give it to somebody. Anyway, what I've done, I've tried washing the socks and they, no way. Now, I'll do the wooden one first. The wooden one has some spots on it around the cockpit in the back that I needed to touch up. And I want to see if I'm going to be able to get them to buff up without sanding. 
especially around the cockpit. The cockpit is one of the prime areas that we've been, I've been spending a, a tremendous amount of time trying to get it nice and smooth. And I'm gonna go right over the sprayed area. Again, the trouble is if I sand it, I know, so I'm trying to do this with as little paint as possible. Remember the criteria here. If we were willing to just put on another eight ounces of clear, well, it, you wouldn't have these buff throughs, but then the plane might or might not be too heavy, might or might have a CG problem. But I always like to save the complex parts to last. I don't like to run off. I would not want to start buffing by buffing out a fuselage. Or, and the last thing is the wing, the silk span bays on the wing. They always seem to take the longest amount of time. Oh yeah, okay. And if you, tw in this case, if you were trying to use up one of those old socks, that's by now it's two or three days old. It's caked. It's hard. Just deep six them. especially around the cockpit. I really would like this to be, and I need to, the last thing is take the little cockpit out. It unscrews out and clean inside of here with a Q-tip or a Kleenex or something. I know there's still some sanding and spray dust in there, different things, because we don't have a sealed area. Where's my... I remember years ago what a big mystery it was to buff out a plane. Oh my God, it was like black magic, mystery, gone, thankfully forever. And a final shine will usually bring it right up. Oh yeah. And you can see right back here, if you can candle that light, now this part isn't buff, this part is. Thing that I'm very conscious of, we have sharp edges up by the scoop, by the valve covers, and on the fillet. So I want to go on both sides of the edge, but I don't want to sand that edge. And down in here, I guess I'm going to have to make a little tool up or something. My finger is just a little bit too large. One of the things you can do is take a sock and fold it back. In this case, let's see if you can get some idea of how I can force that sock in there as a little a little buffing tool. And I don't I want to avoid the edges if at all possible. And it's best to take one little area at a time, not try to do the whole when you try to do a whole area like this, you almost always either buff through or have a problem that is really not not the first choice. trick here is just avoid the edges at all costs. It's those edges, if you pop through that edge, boy, what a touch-up that is. And I need to get my little pinky or something, or make a little dowel to get inside the scoop. I want to get inside there as far as I possibly can. Is something to think about. Just imagine what a nuisance it would be buffing this area out if you had these exhausts already installed. Why we leave the exhausts? You try to leave. You try to buff the plane while it's in convenient pieces that are convenient to to work on, like the flaps, the elevators, and try to do one section at a time. When you try to do too big of an area, in this case, I'm trying to do this little area. There's just no way that I've seen, and, and certainly a buffing wheel has added a question, for me anyway. Some people may be, uh, you know, professional at it or whatever. 
they have some technique that I haven't found yet, but I there's nothing that I've found beats just doing it by hand and paying a price. Because as you're doing this part of it, this part is, is like a very you get a reward right away. It's like being a parakeet or something. You get it doesn't take long before you see some action. And if I even get one of these done tonight, I'll count it as a major coup. We've been up on a roof hammering and banging, and I don't have a lot of energy left at the end of one of these sessions. Mikey works me like a mule. He thinks I'm a mule. Anyway, we want to get that fan in off. We want to get a spray booth. This is probably the last video you're going to see where we're painting in some haphazard, non-professional way. We're going pro. That's all there is to it. We're going to get a spray booth made. Now, when I get, and I've always tried to do this, even a section like this, is get a little clean paper towel now, not using up last week's paper towel from two years ago. There's so many little ways that you can go wrong, and it gets to be very unsatisfying, and if you follow the system right down to the last detail, you're going to win every time. And your wife will love you. Your wife will say, wow, what a real man. He buffed out his plane this year. There's a technique to it. There's an art to it. There's a science to it. I don't know. It's something that, boy, if I was 16 years old again and I could have known how to do this, I could have been a, one of these world-class stunt flyer guys. Instead, I'm President Nixon's phone answer. Look at that shine. We got to get this phone. Another thing that may be, may be of some value for people to know, one of the things I look for all the time as I'm buffing, I'm rubbing it with my hand, of course. Now, in this case, we have striping, set, and ink all in the same area. If I see the, and we're in the, what I hope will be the final stages of this, if I see the towel turning black, I know I've hit some ink. And that basically means I have to stop at that point. That's the end of buffing. I've buffed off as much of the clear as I really want to, unless I want to do another touch-up area. Another tip-off is if you see one of the letter sets, you see a corner or an edge or of the letter set kind of starting to disappear, you know you have two choices. You can stop and say, I'll live with this. This is about as shiny as it's going to be. And it probably will last the season before you wear that paint out. The other choice you have is, of course, you can touch it up. In this case, we can go either way because the weather's been so bad that I'm really not, not even thinking about rushing this and trying to get it done in the next few days. We have a whole maybe two weeks more of real intensive work, and it helps me to know that I'm not going to try to rush this down. At this point in time, the last thing you need to have happen, and it happened to Rich Jacobone last year and other people, is you, your plane is running late, you get to this point, and you try to buff the whole plane out in one day, and you, and you basically, very, it's, for me anyway, very, very, very frustrating to do that. Now, once I put on any of the fun, look at this. President Nixon, he, you know, I wish he'd come and help me buff this plane out. Get over here, Nixon one of the areas and I've been trying to evaluate these areas very carefully where at this point in time if a, if this were not a take apart aeroplane getting in here around the tail and area it would be a nightmare and I imagine for some people it's it's downright undoable to get in between and all the little areas and crevices but I've been trying to evaluate and balance how many things are a gain with a take apart plane now, you know, people I've talked to, the best, the best saying I've heard so far is when you make a take-apart plane, it's like making a plane with six cowlings. Yeah, that's, that may be true, but, but the time you save buffing it out, and I'm not sure I, did I agree or disagree with that yet, but I have really saved over, let's say, buffing out the Spitfire, which was a one-piece plane. Ma, ma, you can't imagine how many times you're leaning over and you're in some crazy angle you can't get back to, but... 
and also repairing it. Now we're in the middle of making up a real spray booth outside, but if we did, if we had a spray booth right now, and if it wasn't snowing and raining and everything crazy out there, one of the things I would be thinking about doing is any little spot here, I could just go and just touch it up. Well, we may, we haven't hit any real bad spots on this yet. We've had a couple little spots where I sanded through, but maybe I'm learning something here anyway. Anyway, you get some idea of it. It's it's really starting to shine and shimmer in almost every spot. You can see up here I've got a spot I haven't done yet. This side looks like we've got... And this is how you have to look for spots. Now see what I'm doing? I'm candling the light. See how the light's flowing to the back of the plane? And I'm looking for a spot that's dull. And if I find a spot that's dull, that's the spot I want to work on. Now up around the, ca the canopy, looks like that's pretty well done. When I flip it to this side, see fine enough, obviously I haven't done this side yet. That spot there is dull. The top is kind of coming along. Up around the nose, you can see most of the spots up here are on the way to being done. You just got to get used to candling it and finding the dull spots and then working on them. And the nice part, I know you'll be happy to hear it. as soon as I finish this fuselage, I have another one to do. And President Nixon will not be helping me. Now, there's always little parts on each one of these pieces, and I've been cleaning them up as I go along, taking the paint off the horn legs, off these little pegs, the tail wheel wire. Want to get all the paint off. Because basically, once once the buffing is done, this plane is ready to move on to the, the final assembly stages. Sounds like we work at Boeing or something here, final assembly. But anyway, after a long, hard winter of work, we're, so, we're finally closing in on it. Now, sometimes it pays to do this on something like a wire leg. You just scratch it off, and then you can peel it with your finger. And it has been some long winter. If you haven't seen the whole Miss Ashley series of tapes, well, it's been a long, very creative, I think it has been anyway, very inventive set of videos. And it's been a good learning experience for me to try to do some of these things with composites. No telling if any of them are going to pan out. And if they don't, we have a wood fuselage just in case. Now this will be the end of this, and I'm going to try to start that other fuselage tonight. But basically, uh, may not finish it tonight. We want to try to not. I'm trying like be to be very careful not to rush any part of this. Anyway, one down. One to go. And one of the things I want to see is how that candy apple blue is going to buff out. Real excited about seeing that become part of the Brodak product line. And one of the things I wanted to do, I wanted to take, as long as I'm cleaning up each part individually, since I can take the cockpit out and do this and clean it and dust it and blow it off with an air dryer. There's still some spray dust in there. I also, I can get this out of here, I also can get inside the cockpit and you can see the stuff that accumulates in there. In fact, I can see my fingerprints in there. How many times have you wished you could get inside a cockpit and clean it? Well, now with the Ronco Bassomatic, you can. Just kidding. This is the first ship I've had that I can do this to. And it certainly seems like something that's, I can even get up in the front there. Something that's gonna pay dividends in the, in the future. Up the screws, get all the paint off the pads, get the paint off the washers, so this is ready. 
Nice neat nose section. That worked out very well. Still have to put the Uniflow vent in. Coming down a home stretch here. Found handy is a is a Q-tip with a bend in it. You get right up in there. You can even put a coat of pledge or some something up in there if we wanted to. So it's funny with the sea fire with the open cockpit. Never had oil inside the cockpit. Okay, now I can put this little guy just two screws and he's back in business. I thought that was one of the nice little features of this plane. It's just a question of tightening up a few screws. Well, with the phone ringing and everything else happening here, we didn't get much else done. We're going to work on our other fuselage tomorrow. That'll be another session. But little by little, it's shaping up. And I guess by just looking at it every day at the end of the session, I can tell or I can feel good about uh, the relatively high amount of effort that's going into this plane. Now today when I work on this piece, this is the carbon fiber piece, I'd like to try to finalize this. I'm looking around because I want to avoid having to touch this up if possible anymore. I don't want to touch it up any more than I have to. And I wanted to see, because this is a test color of Brodac candy apple paint up here, just how that was going to buff up. One of the areas, I don't know if I mentioned this before, when I take a piece of real soft balsa wood, and when I'm finally done with all the buffing I intend to do, getting into these areas, and there's areas like this on every plane, the cowling, some specific little areas where you, you just need to be able to, now obviously if you have little tiny fingers, or you can get some, some midget to do it for you. But I don't want to have an, I don't want to have an area on here that's, you know, it's going to stand out like a sore thumb that it's not buffed out. The trick is to use really, really soft wood and just use plenty of gorums. The gorums will cut the paint very nicely, even if, even if you don't have a direct contact. The, the material just rubbing on it will cut it. The material itself cuts. Again, just another little detail. But if you were to try to get in here with your bare hands, especially into this entry slot on the on this NASA scoop, I think you'd really have difficulty getting it nice and smooth. Now I'm almost finished with the buffing, and what I wanted to say is how that color blue is going to pop. It buffed right up, but I want to put the final shine on it and get a look at what the final color will be. Because with candy apple colors or with any really bright colors, you don't really see the exact color, number one, until it's buffed. The buffing changes it. And until you actually take it out in the sun, the sunlight changes it also. Now, it buffed up relatively nice, but it's going to change a little bit with that final shine. Now the nicest thing is in the end of this session, I guess, we'll be ready to do the wing and that's it. We're coming down the home stretch here. And when I lay the model out on a floor as I do at the end of every session just to see how it's coming out, I always get a little bit of a, well, anticipation for seeing how it's going to look when it's all bolted together and ready to fly. And we're coming up on that time relatively soon. And each time you build a model like this, it's you look at it and at the end of the year, it's another year of your life, one way or another. Now there's the what will be the final color. I don't know how many people either like that or don't like it, or I think that's one of the nicest colors on a model. Anyway, this about finishes the fuselage. 
And the next thing we're going to have to work on is the wing, and that's the big job. We saved that for last. Well, it's finally <laughs> all of these little parts, all of this work, and the last part of this. And I doubt we'll do it in one or two sessions, but we're going to do it very carefully. Is the wing. So let me get the table jigged up for the wing. Finally reached the time, and believe me, this was a long time coming. I hope we're going to have all the touch-ups done. Yeah, but if we don't, if I happen to buff through and. You can see where some of the touch-ups were around. All of the high spots. In by the fillets, there's a couple little low spots still. But if you constantly work on them, it just seems like right now I would like not to go through anymore. The reality is I probably won't have that happen. But if I do, I can touch it up with very small amounts. I don't have to go back and recoat the whole wing. So what I want to do is just to see how hard the dope is, I want to pick a spot, and it can be any. I'm, I'm obviously doing the bottom first because the top has more dope on it, first of all. Remember that two-third, one-third ratio. Now, another thing, this plane has very soft wood on the leading edge, so it tends to be like we call it a starving horse. So what you want to try to avoid is doing this because you'll pick up all the high spots. What a, one of the tricks I use when you have a, a plane that has this sheeting that has, or an I-beam, you want to do in between each rib. You don't want to do this constantly, or you're going to wear out the dope on the high spots. Now, I figured I would do the, the flat spots before the open bays. The reason for that is pretty simple. It gives the open bays a little extra time to harden up, and every extra day is going to be a help, that's for sure. But it looks like it's... Nah, it looks like it. Well, let's hope it's coming right up. It's easier, even though there's no rib cap here, to do one bay like this at a time. And again, if we had, if we had sheeted it like the Spitfires with 332nd wood or with heavier wood, harder wood, you could do that motion, or if you had a foam wing or whatever. But when you have those ripples, you don't want to pick up the same way. You never want to go over cap strips this way. You want to treat each bay the long way. And if you understand why, if you haven't you'll probably be very, very happy with the result. The minute you go this way and pick out a, if you see people who buff through the rib caps, and I'm one of them, really gets frustrating. Anyway, I wanna, I'm allowing two or three days to do this. The weather is finally broken that it's a little bit nicer, so from the point this is done, we have a couple more days of work to do on a plane. Make a push rod up, make landing gear, things like that. And we have a brand new Jet 60. We're going to break that in. We're going to make up a special tune pipe for this. We have a bunch of other tune pipes to make up, but basically, at this point in time, even though we're looking at two or three more days of buffing, it doesn't really matter because I know we're coming down the home stretch. Get some idea how that buffed up. Now I tried to get this first panel done because I'll tell you one thing, <laughs> your arm gets tired doing this. But it looks like within this, this short session we had, we were able to bring one panel up to uh, relatively nice buffing. And the next time we get to work on this, we're going to go out there and work on that other panel. But even getting this much done, at least it starts to look like, well, whatever you have in your mind's eye that it should look like, starting to really pick up. And what happens is the red really, really pops, turns into a really bright color. today what I want to try, I want to try doing one of these panels just to see if I'm closing in on having this dope dry enough. A couple of tricks for doing open bays. You never want to go across the ribs, that's for sure. I think I mentioned that yesterday. 
You also never want to go crazy and just buff out the cap strips. The cap strips get buffed automatically by the edges of your working on them. Also, the edges up around here and here tend to get thin and soft too. So what I try to do is I try to work into the corners now. On a normal D-tube wing, it's the corners that are more than likely going to go with the least amount of buffing. So I want to work the corners first. And I want to work the edges. I've got one finger in the sock trying to get the edges without resting on that high spot. And then I want to work the middle of the bay. And I want to get the first part of this done with the sock, which seems to grind away the most amount of material. And normally I do the outside of the bays first and leave the bays go to last. But right now I want to see if I've got one panel done. And what happens, I just run out of just run out of gas being an old fart like I am. I move this a little bit. Okay, it's half coming up. So now I want to transition into having paper towel. The paper towel will take even more detailing and get more of the scratches out. Now some people, and I know like Jimmy Cassell used to buff the whole plane with paper towels. The only problem is you'll use 10 rolls of paper towels by the time you're done. I kind of feel a combination of using a sock or a terry cloth and then finalizing it with and what I'm trying to do is put on the tape just how much time goes into each bay. Because I, if you have 28 bays or 62 bays or whatever, or the Bay of Pigs Invasion, whatever you have. Okay, now that's starting to look okay. I always want to get the all of it off and see if I have any. Now up here I can see some scratches. So when I see the scratches, I know I've missed a spot. But those final scratches, I owe, especially on the bays, I want to get them out before I go on to polishing or doing final shine. I want to get all the scratches out, as many as possible. There it goes. And down at the edge, just some. And there is something about just the feel of a buffed out. I don't know, when you run your hand on it, or you go over to your wife sitting at the computer and show her what a man you are for buffing out your plane. Okay, now I want to get a little bit of... Oh, I had some on a rag here before. And the final shine, usually you'll get all the, the little scratches out that don't come out with the gorms, even those microscopic scratches. So now, if we have 28 bays on a plane, or 56, you just multiply that by 56 or 82 or something. Let's see how that looks on a camera. Do that 56 times and you'll be in the front row too. And this is the fun part, when you get done with a pen.
That's the thing. Now you can see the light reflecting. That's what sets an ice D tube or an I beam wing aside from, you know, one with no ribs. Really a watershed. We are on. I got two more bays to do. If you knew what my right arm felt like, unbelievable. It'd be a arm wrestler or something. Anyway, we're finishing this up. We're definitely going to be able to finish this today. And I guess uh, we want to clean all the paint off all the little gauges, the horns, the lead out guide. And tomorrow we'll get ready to do the hinging, I guess. I'm looking around, trying to, I'm trying to make a little priority list of all the little jobs that still have to be done. We got some props to balance. We may even get Wayne Triven to make us up a carbon fiber gas tank. We're, we've been on our knees crawling like a reptile, hoping that he'll feel sorry for me and make me one of those tanks. Two more to go. Boy, when you get down to the, the last few, boy, it really starts to... Two to go. Oh. We are. We finally arrived at the last bay. We have no socks. I've used about 30 pairs of socks. Karen has advised me there are no socks left in the house. No paper towels. We're at the end of our second jar of gorms, but boy, when you get to this point, there is a reward at the end of buffing one of these guys. I don't even know how to describe it, but I do know it exists. And I feel, if you've ever done one of these and spent, and I'm guessing we spent 40 or 50 hours doing this all together, of what we've condensed down to about an hour, hour and a half of video, but I hope those little tips from that, because in my mind I'm making up this little priority list now of all the little extra steps. It looks like the weather might even be in our favor here. Get this guy put together. We have to make landing gear up. Hinges. But there is a reward at the end of it. The reward is you can become a, a bodybuilder with your right arm. One arm is about three inches bigger than the other right now. We use just just a little less than two jaws of gorums to do this, and about six or seven rolls of paper towels. But we are, and this is the moment of truth, we are at the end of, wow. Need to dress that off. We are at the end. By the way, I looked at the end of that tape that Al Rabe sent, and there's a lot of cool stuff on there. The fellow that did the tape did some stenciling with some stencil paper held down with just water. Oh, there was there was other things on there that were just real nice how he shaded the letters. So I hope he's gonna be writing about that for stunt news. That's really some nice information. And obviously he's a professional painter, so he has all the technology for car paint down pat. That looks like, yes, we're, we're ready for the final shine here. But there is really a tremendous feeling of satisfaction when this is over with. I can't tell you how relieved I am. <laughs> anyway, Miss Ashley is buffed. Now the only thing left to do, and this is something I like to take my time doing, I want to pull these eyelets out, scrape the paint off, or in some cases you can take a Q-tip and some lacquer thinner, but obviously you don't want to get it on a plane. Get the paint off of these. Get the paint off of the horn. This is all the old spray paint and everything that goes around on this. Clean that all up. Well, I'll tell you, that's some feeling of satisfaction for me. I don't know how to describe this. If you've, if you've never buffed one of these, you don't know what you're missing, probably. But when you get to this point and it's all done, you look back and the time you spent, I don't know, to me anyway, it seems like it's always a good time. It's always time well spent. 
And that really, I don't know how you could get any other finish other than buffed out dope. So it has a look. It has a very special look that reflects the light. And I don't know that there's anything other than Brodak dope that does that, or dope, period. Anyway, we're going to do all that little cleanup, and then get back here tomorrow and start working on some of the other little details. the plain all buffed and hanging up over there it's one of my favorite days of the year I call it hinge day and what I do is I have a box with all my old hinges and I try to keep some of every size and so I have cotter pin hinges and whatever whatever but I still like of course the old IM hinges and I'm looking around of course this is a problem I don't think I have enough to do this plane I may or may not here's another one I'm gonna have to and if I don't I'll have to uh, go over to Mike Kajeski's and steal his I know I know where he's he where he hides them too Anyway, looks like, well, maybe we do have enough. I don't know. But I also, I want to dye whatever hinges. These are already pre-dyed. If I don't have enough, I'll try to get some from Mike and use the RIT dye. This will be one of the things. I'll make a little quick blurb about how to do this. But, of course, my hinges are going to have to come apart because I want to have the surfaces removable. So this is the part of it. I want to have some of everything available and see what I can come up with here for a good system. Now this looks like I'm going to have just enough hinges for this plane, IM hinges. These are not IMs, these are Dubros, but I, I'm assuming in the future this is going to be our replacement. So for, and of course you can dye them in boiling RIT dye. I'm going to have to dye the hinges for the rudder. I don't have enough for the rudder. Maybe I'll put a minute or two of that on video. It's kind of simple to dye hinges. They start off life being clear nylon, and of course you can pull a pin out if you need to. And after sitting in a batch of boiling RIT dye for about 10 minutes, they kind of look like this. You can pull a pin out. The IMs, which started life clear, wound up this color. And what I've done to each hinge, these are ones that I've done, I've previously done, so I'm, I may not even have to boil more IMs. What I've done is, obviously clipped off the excess, and then with a Dremel tool, turned this into kind of a little washboard because the wood only goes in a quarter of an inch so it's pointless to have all this extra overhang and these now what I'll have to do with these is I need to pull out the little pin grind off one end pull a pin out so that I can run a wire and I'll, I'll ultimately have the wire as as a removable piece so that the elevator and flaps will come off the hinges I need for the rudder so I may as well quit fooling around I can the die can be cooking on this what you do is take some boiling water. You can really cut the end of this pin off if need be so it doesn't chew up the wood. But the first thing I do is get a drop of oil down a pin barrel so that we don't, while it's boiling, I don't wind up with that pin rusting on me. So let me mix up a little. You can do it in a coffee cup. A little bit of RIT dye. In fact, what I do the last time I used RIT dye, I kind of saved what was left over. That's probably enough to dye up the, uh, the rudder hinges. And they can be cooking while I start laying out the elevators and the flaps. And one of these, these are IMs, and what I did, I pulled out, just ground off one end of this. Look at this, still a razor edge on there. Pulled the pin out. I wanted to mic the pin. The pin is 49 thousandths, 50 thousandths probably. This is brass wire. I can't, yeah, brass plated wire. It's a soft, let's see, it's soft wire. It's not even, yeah, it's soft wire. It's not even music wire. So anyway, now what I want to do is establish what diameter wire, and I'm and I'm guessing, you know, obviously you could use a wire that's a much smaller diameter to save weight, but I'd like to get them, if I use that, I'm afraid I would have some chatter in there, and I think I have some 039 wire, I want to see if that's going to work. And this was like 37 thousandths. Again, it doesn't have to really be music wire. It can be. I'm not going to wear the wire out. And even if you were, you could replace the wire. 
Yeah, that seems to be, well, still a little slow. Well, I could live with that amount. And we're almost guaranteed going to wind up with the hinge lines taped anyway. Future reference, the big Dubro hinges, the ones that have cotter pins, an 039 wire, which is a standard music wire, seems to fit in there perfectly. Because the day is coming when we have no more IM hinges. And boy, if anybody up there, like, <clears throat> won't mention any names, has some IM hinges he'd like to donate, and I say donate because we'll swap you for something, I don't know what. Yeah, that's a nice fit, too, for a take-apart hinge. The big Dubros are a good choice. I'm just doing this for my own reference now. Testing this. This is Brand X hinges are smaller diameter, probably 032. Yeah. So you, the best choice would be if there if there are no more. If you get to the point in life where you have no more IM hinges, and there was a time when Joe K was alive, we had started the die to make our own IM hinges for the hobby. He died before we finished the die, unfortunately. So okay, we yet we know we're going to use a 39 thousandths wire. Now you might be thinking, why not just use a, an 032 or something? Well, I've noticed when you have an 032 and the tweener and a couple of the cardinals that have take apart cons flaps, not construction, the flaps come off. Once you get the wire halfway in, you can't push the rest of the wire in conveniently. So using an 039, I guess, is going to be the compromise of choice here. Okay, obviously you can use a just old boiling water and any amount of dye. It's not a real critical thing. Don't have to worry like if it's one little bit too much or not enough, but it needs to boil. If it doesn't boil, it hinges what happens. They sit in there all day and they don't turn color. Here they are. Bump them right in. Now a lot of times, some of the nylons, they don't take the dye. And of course you can dye them red, yellow, green, blue. They'll sit here for a half an hour and not take the dye. What you need to do is just reboil the water. And I'll let this sit while I'm working on the other part of the hinging. This can sit a good half hour, 45 minutes. Want to get any more dye on you than you need to. This dye just winds up getting on your on your clothes, on your workbench, so it's a good idea to do it with a lot of newspaper around or rubber gloves. Step is with a with the Dremel cutoff wheel, cut all the pins off the hinges, and then clean them real good with M600. By the way, the important part of this, and this is on a lot of the other videos in detail, when you're going to do permanent hinging, just check out one of those, the washboard effect, it gives the epoxy a place to sit. If these are smooth, mm, I don't know, but I know the washboard has a real good reliability factor. The more oil you can scratch that in some way, just to get as many as many little ripples in there as you can. When we're done, that's what we'll wind up with. One thing I did on the original Stray I used these black dyed hinges, exactly the same as you see, and I used a hinge and then the space of a hinge front and back. And I did it really for appearance. I just kind of liked the way it looked. It wasn't, people think it's to seal a hinge line. No, the only way you're gonna seal a hinge line is with a piece of tape. And on this plane, I just, two reasons. I didn't have enough hinges. And I just thought maybe we'll save a quarter of an ounce or so in weight over doing it the old-fashioned way. Good friend Mike, this, see, see all these hinge pockets? This is where I know if I run out of hinges, I know where I can find some hinges over at Mike's shop. Anyway, very soon we're going to be, Mike and I are going to kind of both be working out at a molding shop in the garage, so I know he has some hinges. What I have, I've got all the hinges put, a, take the pins taken out. I'm going to let them soak in M600 for about two or three minutes because I want to make sure when I go to put the epoxy on here, one thing I don't want to have is some of the old oily residue or grease or fingerprints. I want to have the hinges as clean as possible. It can really be a disaster to have hinges loosen up. We just let them sit there. And you can see some of the junk that's come off. Now if you were using, you know, hinges with the pin in, you'd want to do the opposite thing. You'd want to have a little bit of oil on that pin of the hinge to keep it from locking up solid. In this case, well, I guess we don't need to do that. 
Now let these dry. Now he has one. I didn't even notice. Here's one that isn't. Oh, maybe we have two. Any any of these that are shiny, I want to take the most important step is get that to look like a washboard. In fact, that's the step that really matters. And you're having to take a part system like this would be that if a hinge were to fail, it would be a v relatively simple operation to get in here with, an, a, with a clean blade and put it, replace a hinge, where when the hinges are glued in, it's a nightmare to get them replaced if they ever wear out. We're just trying to evaluate the thoughts of a take-apart plane relative to a, a one-piece airplane. Okay, the first step, what I did is I put in the wire and the hinges just in one piece, just to get a test fit and see how far I need to leave the hinges sticking out. Now, what I'm thinking might be, and I'm inventing this as I go along, of course, what I'm thinking might be the easy thing here is I'll glue the hinges with the wire in place into the back, into the elevator, and then insert this all in one unit. Again, I'll see which way and see if I can come up with some way that's relatively, uh, well, the easiest way possible. I want to get all the little smidges and I'll go wash my hands. I know I got a little sloppy here. If you do get a little, see the little smudge right there? One little shot of gorms right now would be a good chance to get, you have a real good chance of getting it off if a towel doesn't take it off. There we go. It's a lot easier if you get these little spots before they dry. Now this is one step I can't rush. I have to just take each part individually. And for sure you don't want to try attaching this to the stab. Either way, you want these hinges to be perfectly dry. We'll let it sit a half an hour or so. Make sure we're still not soft. A little bit of heat, of course, would help if you could put it up by a hairdryer. Any kind of little heat. All that I use, I forgot to show this before. Ooh, look, it's all. You can check now. I leave this epoxy so I can see when it's hardened up. But what I've done is, let me just, I use this to set the epoxy down into the hinges and you just take some a parting wheel and put some scratches in it pretty much the same as like I said you take a parting wheel and cut President Nixon's tongue out it's the first part dries of course I've let it sit look at this I get a big smudge oh god right, I have the epoxy on that's ready to push right in Okay, now with that, I put the epoxy down into the slots. This is where you get wind up getting it on your hands. Uh, but I'm not doing brain surgery here. Always use your pants for a rag, as Karen would say. Now I don't want to make this so tight that it'll be difficult to get the wire in and out. I want to see the wire nice and straight. Once that's in place, now I can go in here with a whole bunch of q-tips got to kind of work quickly here even though we have about 15 minutes with this epoxy well I like to give myself all the time in the world good thing q-tips are cheap now once I get it in place and I know the epoxy is still soft here even though I'm videotaping and trying to run around here what I do is this, I try to move it in and out, in and out, in and out, and that just sets the epoxy, smears it around a little bit, make sure my hinge line is nice and straight, as I set it back, and if there's some real smudgy stuff, I can get some gorms, and until that actually kicks off, I babysit it. I'll spend five or ten minutes and get it
common areas, a, a Q-tip with just a, just a drop of alcohol, not a lot of alcohol. You don't want to ruin the paint. I can get that last little bit of... Got to kind of look at this in the light two different ways. And while I'm babysitting this, the important part of babysitting it is to make sure that wire is going to come out, make sure it's perfectly straight. And I'll just keep an eye on that. And of course, once it's totally dry, I can pull the wire and make sure that sits in there real nice. This is this is one of the things that you don't think about until it's already <laughs> it's already too late. We obviously want to still be able to remove the wire. Uh, even though this is tacked up, I want to move the wire about the thickness of one hinge, just in case there's a little drop of epoxy or something on there. I also want to, before this really sets up and gets hard, I want to take a paper towel with some little bit of gorms and just go by each one of the hinges, because if there's any epoxy, just a little burr out there, a little spot, I want to get it off right now. And I always try to, in between doing one of these, obviously wash your hands because there's always a little epoxy. Now, and in the past, what I, oh, here we got a nice big glob of it right there. This is a typical spot right here. There's a big glob of epoxy. It's Now it's chewing gum before it turns into a rock. And then the last little bit, you can see what that looks like. Getting the hinges in, being able to put the hinges in effectively once the plane is built, either this way or if you invent some way of your own. Boy, that just makes the buffing, and that's why I wanted this on the buffing video. That's a part of it. If you had to go in and sand and buff these hinge lines while the hinges were installed, I find it to be just a big time saver anyway. Now I know other people do it. Okay, and I'm going to look around now real carefully. What I'm going to do now is run over, wash my hands, make sure I don't have a little bit of epoxy, and then go right. See, I got a little spot right here as I'm speaking. And just take care of this. Because the epoxy will come right off at this point in time. And the final shine kind of gives you a little, a little edge in that one. That side looks okay. There's a stop right spot right there. This is not a, the epoxy is just like, well, it's in a, I call it cheese, that's the term they use. I can still pick away at it and get pieces of it to come out so that this is nice and neat. Of course, once I have this done, I can pull a, pull a pin and get in here with a little buffing compound, but right now I just don't want to have hard globs of epoxy. I can kind of outline each hinge. Another one of the little details that I really, I really think sets the planes up in the front row of a couple of rows. You start to look, the judges start to look for things that are just a little better on one plane than the other. Okay, now before I remove the pin and work on this any further, hey, I can work on a wing. The flaps are going to be exactly the same, no difference at all. But I wouldn't want to, while this epoxy is still relatively soft, I don't want to go tugging and pulling on the hinges. I just pull the the wire out just a bit so if there's a little epoxy in a hinge it won't stick there and we'll come back and work on that later but in the meantime I'll do it off camera because it's exactly the same as putting the hinges in a wing then in today's mail a couple of pictures from Peter White in Australia this is his Zodiac with a, Mo a Moki 51 and he's also sent another nice picture of Reading, reading the captions he sent on this. He loves Noblas. He's built three of them. This one's 38 ounces. And it looks like it's got uh, Kawasaki green paint on it. Anyway, Peter from Australia. One of the people we seem to correspond with by email almost every day. And glad he's enjoying the Nobla. Pete, hey. And he just bought a VCR so he can play American tapes in Australia. Way to go, Peter. Anyway. Thanks for the photos. We'll pass them on to Stunt News. 
some photos from Joe Owen, who's just in love with the Windy Nobler videos for some reason. Says his Nobler's coming out better than mine, and I guess he's right. Sent this little print out here. That's what I love about the world of computers. We can swap things back and forth, compare them, laugh at each other, have a great time. And Joe, I really appreciate the nice comments. Glad you're enjoying the videos here. I love to carve so much. Who needs a windy molded top block? <laughs> it really is a lot of work molding that. Not molding it, carving it. Final comment is, Windy, when are you going to make me a molded carbon fiber nobler fuselage? Well, Joe, it may be coming quicker than you think. Now, Lucky Pyatt sent along some some real nice pictures of Al Rabe's Bearcat at VSC. I love the shading here. That really looks perfect. These are full. By the way, this is the size of my hand. Is these are nice? I'm going to hang these all in the shop. These are really priceless. Picture of Al looks like Keith Trossel giving him a launch at VSC. Here's a classic, the classic pose we all like. Lucky, these are beautiful pictures. I thank you very much, and I'll, I'll pop a few videos in the mail, give you an idea of what we're doing here on the East Coast. Here's the, here's a really nice one. Now that is, that is, I don't know. I just, anybody that loves semi-scale stuff like I do, that is what we're in the hobby for, right there. That is just awesome. Appreciate it a whole lot. Lucky, hey, and enjoy the videos. Pass them around, and please, when you're done, see that Keith Trossel gets them. Now today, finally, finally got the hinges in here. A couple of things that were just a little different is I wanted to make sure I didn't have any restriction in the controls up or down. That looks like it's working real well. I've previously gotten all the, all the paint scraped off the horn, and I replaced that bushing with an eighth-inch bushing because I want to have the slop at this end of the control system. I just think that'll work better for my purposes. Now, I'll put this aside to dry with all the epoxy. I don't like to handle it until that's, well, that epoxy is finally dried up. And it's such a good feeling and know that once those hinges are in, if anything ever happens to them, uh, just pull a wire, replace one of them. That's a real nice option to have. Same thing with the tail. It's one of the options we've, we've tried to include in on this plane. Next thing we're going to work on is getting those little hinges in the, the rudder and the tailpiece. That die should be dry by now. I want to clean those hinges up, prep this area. Pretty much the same as the, just a repeat performance of the old uh, the elevators. Nothing much change except these hinges will be permanently installed. I don't anticipate any reason we're going to have to take the rudder off. And the longer you let these sit, these have been sitting here for a long time. They're probably good and black by now. Needless to say, this dye is tenacious stuff. Anything you don't want dyed, now I, what I do is rinse these off in clean water and then dry them with paper towels. But all the while, I'll make sure I have rubber gloves on. And once they've been rinsed good in hot water, what I what I do is the first thing is get a little bit of oil on the barrel of the pin, otherwise they rust, and by the morning of the next day they'll be rusted shut. You don't want to have that either. 
Just another little, if you're going to use hinges with the pin already in it permanently. Just dry these up real good. Of course, I'm going to clip them. I only need to leave like a quarter of an inch showing. That's all that needs. The easiest way, of course, I want to put those serrations on it too. I can cut right off the end. And I can get little serrations on this exactly the same as the other hinges. So that what you wind up with is, and I will grind those pins off. I find another thing that chews up the wood when I go to insert them. And you can just shave a few grains here and there by doing things like this. As long as you get a good serration on that, that's the main thing. Now because I don't want these to rust. One drop of oil with the needle oil will usually take care of that. And I can put the serrations on them. Just want to work that. And then I'll clean the outside of it with some M600. I want that oil down in the barrel because I don't want to install these. Nothing worse than getting some epoxy in there and then that, that rudder will be stiff. Again, the step with all of these that really matters is the serration. Last final tip when putting the hinges in, the final hinging, I made up another tool out of a, you know, a typical knife blade. Just put the X crosses in it. And what this will allow me to do, and there's nothing special going on here, is just to get the epoxy well into the hinge pocket of all the hinge pockets. And once that's done to clean the hinge pockets and this will be assembled, then we're ready to move on. things that's handy is before I put the epoxy on this and insert it I want to make sure I still have a drop of oil on that pin because I don't want to have any binding in these hinges even though this is not going to be uh, movable like a flap or an elevator I still want the hinges to operate the way they should find one like I did here that has a, a little drip of epoxy on it you can just fold up some sandpaper we want to have the option of using a rave rudder if at some future time we need that as a trim feature or we'd like to try it. And one of the things we're going to try to do is make up the uh, the Nomex carbon fiber elevators at some future time, flaps and elevators. So we'll have a lot of a lot of choices here, we hope. Insurance that we won't get any more epoxy down in these hinge barrels. A little needle, a needle oil you buy in any train store where they sell HO trains and Lionel trains. Use it for lubricating trains. It's usually got a good high quality oil in it. Actually, it's good for it's good for us too. And I want to mix this up using that little tool. Hey, we're on the home stretch here. This is the last of the hinges. Really gets exciting toward the end of working on a plane. It's just like putting the switch plates on when you renovate a room. You really like to stand back and admire your work. Now this is where this tool comes in handy for inserting the epoxy. Before inserting them, I like to get all the extra off. Again, that oil protects it from, hopefully, that... And, of course, if the trick is to babysit it and move the surface while the epoxy's setting up. You don't want to come back to it after five minutes and go, ah, it's locked in position. Anyway, we're at the end of this video, and I hope this doesn't end while I'm doing something critical like this, but... Hope you've gotten some tips and some ideas on how to do a little bit nicer, neater hinging job. Something that'll serve your modeling needs well. Whoops. Here's what I forgot to do. It is a little spot on, there we go. One of the hinges where it doesn't want to go in. Now before that, obviously before it dries, we want to get 
clean the fingertips off. Now the little fingerprints like this, I'll just get the gorms, get the... And I really do hope you've enjoyed the video and hope you've picked up some good tips. And I really hope that you'll, well, pass them on and help the guys that are still trying to figure out some of the basics of our event, hobby, whatever you want to call us. Anyway, you want to get the fingerprints or any little smudges off before the epoxy dries. And thanks for joining us. And I hope we'll see you on the next tape. us a long time to get to this point but boy there's times and this is one of them when it really all seems worthwhile all those late nights early mornings working through lunch working when you were too tired to work putting a little push on and at this point in time you don't feel any of that pain but you sure feel all the pride and the pleasure that comes from a job well done And I hope we're definitely, definitely going to get this guy completed in the next week or two.